Welcome to week six, Integrated Marketing Communications for Services. Now, as we teach a, an intro to marketing subject and an advertising slash marketing communication subject, most of this week is going to be looking at the application of theories that can be accessed through either your intro notes or your notes from the marketing communication subject. So the key things that we want to be also getting you to think about is this is the last chance before the end of the semester break to do a recap the known and the unknown and we might make a, a little system available for that for the offliners and uh, the people who are attending the class so have a think about what it is that uh, you would like revisited so we can go and do a couple of additional uh, content pieces over the break. Now the housekeeping for the session, uh, when you do roll into the session, there is going to be a combination of theory and practice. We're going to talk you through some of the ideas and we're going to get you to make stuff, do things, like a little bit of a practical workshop style exercise. So you've got a chance to try out the ideas. Because you know, when it comes down to it, what makes an idea really work in the modern business is actually just giving it a go, prototyping and seeing what happens next. Now the objectives for the session is we're going to have a revisit to the concept of segmentation, targeting, positioning. We're going to loop back to some of the theories out of, we're going to mention price a few times. Now promotion is a holistic component part of the marketing mix. I'm going to explain how that works, but fundamentally in services, because things are intangible, we can have the communication of a service create value that changes the perception of the service, which in turn changes what people do with their service. So promotion can influence products, can influence delivery, can influence perception, can influence quality, which means it can swing right around the back, get into influencing what people perceive as a good price for the service and therefore we have a holistic approach. This is all about the crossover. And the last thing is that uh, for the classroom there will be a self-service, self-branding exercise to undertake. Now the key thing in all of services marketing theory is that we have perception governing reality. What the customer perceives is what becomes real in the service environment. So irrespective of objective elements such as speed of processing or ease of access measured in objective terms, so speed of processing, a file is turned around and returned to you in seven working days, if you have a perception it should be back in three, then seven is forever and long and late. If you think it's 14 days is a reasonable turnaround time, 15 days is three working weeks, then back in three days, you'll ask the question of, well, did you put enough effort in? Was there enough quality? Perception governs reality. What you think it is in services will have a greater impact than anything we can point to and say, this is what it actually is. So the couple of learning outcomes are IMC plus services, so it's all about the merger of the ideas. Uh, it's about looking at some of the ways in which we can use aspects of IMC to really support services marketing, but also what services marketing does in terms of messing up some of our standards of uh, some of our practices and some of our standard processes for physical goods based marketing communications. Let's go back and have a quick look at a couple of the fundamental theories. The communications mix. Now if you hated this back in the intro because you really just wanted to focus on the marketing mix and the communication mix comes along and you got things crossed over, but basically it's going to come down to this. There are some well established key elements of communications theory that are basics and fundamentals, paid advertising, free publicity, paid personal selling, paid sales promotion, paid sponsorship, free and paid social media. 
These are the core areas in which you would expect to deliver an advertising message. So these are the areas for which we have some established work that we're just going to point you to and say, go to the other aspects of marketing, draw on them. In services marketing, personal selling has a much higher role uh, because of the nature of co-production, meaning that quite often the customer is present at the point of production. The customer is quite often present at the point of sale and the sale becomes production. So that's why personal selling is really strong in services. Also because of the human, human relationships, the human interaction elements, the idea that the service employee can explain the service that you then go off and acquire. Now there's a standard issue IMC question here that we have of how to sequence your services process. Step one is always select your target market. In services, the reason why this is always step one is step 1A is select who will occupy the space of the customers in the seduction model. So pick who your primary target market is, look at the seduction model and go, who is playing the role of the other target audience? Who is playing the role of the other customer? Is it other members of the same target market or is it a different target market that will be involved? So this is an important decision because if you're not factoring this in, it's very easy to suddenly get yourself a little bit distracted on select a target market, then select a secondary target market that doesn't have a compatibility or a baseline comparison or the kind of market that wouldn't, you can have a market A and a market B and the two of them can be served by your service product but the pair of them won't like each other if they're both in the same, uh, same space at the same time. And for that we have carefully divided stadiums in European and British soccer. So pick your target market. Next, with this target market, what is your objective for communicating with them? Why are you opening the, why are you opening the dialogue? What is it that makes it worthwhile for you to contact, to send a message to this target audience? Do you in, anticipate informing them? So your challenge is the market is unaware of your product or how to use your product or some technical, educational or informational aspect of your product. Do you want to persuade them? Are they well aware of your product but they're just not buying it anyway and you're trying to convince them either of its quality, its value, value for money, its relevance. This is things like corporate social responsibility. Buy our product, we're saving the planet. Buy our product, we're destroying the planet. Depends on your market. Do you want to remind people that you exist and that they should come back and buy your service again? Or do you want to reinforce the people who have just bought your service and guide them through the cognitive dissonance cycle so that they are coming back on the other side going, this was a worthwhile decision. We bought buying into the service was the right choice. So if you think of your four objectives, if you are, you're going to see that these objectives tie to certain points in the product life cycle. You're going to see that there are roles for each objective and value. But the objectives determine one other thing. They determine the outcomes that you're going to monitor. So if you're going to set an objective of informing people, your positioning strategy, your message and your media channels are going to support that. But then you have to do a baseline measure of how many people know about your product now, run the information campaign, how many people know about the inf now know this new piece of information that you are providing. So you want to be one eye when you set your objective is, how do we know that we have reached our objective? How do we monitor for that? Step three is the budgetary considerations. I teach my subjects as strategic decision making subjects, budgets are tactical. Also, budgets are entirely to paste based on the organization you're working for. Uh, the book does have a nice little selection of different budgeting types, but at the end of the day is, we also have accounting, finance, and other majors that handle 
budgets and project management stuff like that so use their skills positioning strategy so step four now positioning strategy is really important when we get into the idea of referent pricing because you need to have people thinking what where does your service fit into their mental model lineup what are you like what are you unlike what's the closest service substitute what's the closest service of nature that's what a positioning strategy looks like it's in the minds of the uh, consumer so you can't control it so much as influence it finally on to step five once you know who you're targeting what it is you want to do how much money you've got to do it and where you currently exist in the minds of the consumer then you can start getting to making a message then you can start thinking how do I make a message that is selective for the target market of interest and they'll respond to it in a mostly uniform way or a sufficiently uniform way to have made them a valid and viable target market. Knowing as well that sometimes your message will go out to people who aren't your target market so you need to ensure that not only can your message hold up against and be valuable for your target segment but it shouldn't be detrimental to your client so if it's client customer it shouldn't be de detrimental to partners and to society at large so there's a little there's a lot of challenges and message uh, strategy now media selection is what how are you going to reach your target audience again the reason why we pick narrow target audiences is so we know how to reach them if you've selected a target market of all people in southeast Queensland you're like well good luck on finding a media channel that reaches all of them if you've been more uh, selective and gone in Canberra on the north side of Canberra people who are located in Belconnen and surrounding shop surrounding suburbs who shop at the Belconnen Westfield amongst other places then you know where to put your targeted advertising that's a narrow cast of physical storefront displays and pop-up displays inside the Westfield Belconnen to reach an audience located close around that proximity, that geographic market point. So your target markets need to be, uh, the reason I keep going on and on about specificity of target markets and why they should be narrow and why there should be many of them, is you want a market that will respond Mostly, most members of the market will respond in a similar manner to your message, to your IMC. And to reach them, you know where they are on social media. The final thing you want to do in all advertising campaigns. Every advertising campaign is, in fact, experimental design. You put a message out. So it is uh, a all message... All marketing campaigns are experiments. This particular approach is you have a pre-test and a post-test. You have a set of objectives which are functional uh, business world hypothesis. You go off, you assume that if it's information, there's a level of ignorance. You try and measure how well you're known in the market. You run a series of campaigns to raise people's awareness of your product. You measure afterwards, it's experimental design. So market research shows up here in services marketing as not only understanding the positioning strategy, but it's how you're going to measure the outcomes. The next aspect to I want to mention here is we start seeing this come up in the book. Is the idea of the product lifecycle has just made a repeat return appearance from a few other sections of marketing theory. The product, the PLC, for all its faults and its benefits. The PLC is a way to think about how does a target audience respond or perceive the product offer. So introduction, growth maturity, maturity decline, these are in the product life cycle, these are abstractions. These are top level ideas of, does this audience have any familiarity with your product? 
did you recently redesign it, redevelop it? Is it a new product offering? Have you never served this market before? If any of those are the case, then you're in the introductory stage of the product life cycle. You may also, just for a quick asterisk here, is you may also measure product life cycle abstracted out to the customer level of has the customer encountered a value offer of a similar nature? Is it the first time they've encountered a value offer of this type, irrespective of how it's delivered? Intro. Are they familiar with these? Because there's lots, like it's a new product for you, but they've got plenty of other products that solve this sort of problem. It's growth maturity. You can be absolutely late to the target market. If you were to bring out a new form of newspaper, print media, that's the secret. You're going into maturity decline market at the abstraction level of you know, the industry level. But if you were to bring out a micro-targeted newspaper, effectively it's a fanzine with, uh, that's been upgraded, a micro-targeted newspaper for the target audience of people who still want physical copy. They don't really like computers, they don't really like the internet, and they want physical copy so micro-targeted, niched around suburban issues that could go into growth maturity uh, if you're going up against existing, uh, if there are still newspapers out in the suburbs, or you could do something that is, you know, will do a suburb zine, sign zine, however you want to pronounce it, small, short, locally produced, small print run, print magazine, usually in black and white, quite often hand-drawn, and photocopied, but a new way, a new product into the market, PLC opens up intro. So you've really got to crack open on the PLC theory, you've got to decide how to make best use of it. And the thing about services marketing, one of the things to consider is that when you have a highly customizable product, or a product that is frequently delivered in an inconsistent and customized way, you're quite often cracking open intro and growth maturity on a routine basis, potentially with the same audience. If they don't know what they're going to expect each time they go to see you, and things are going to vary significantly, then there is an opportunity to think about, is it a new product each time? Is it a growth market? Is it an intro market? How does it work? So always, always be thinking about how you can use and reuse your theories and product, theories and your ideas. But let's take a fundamental, let's just go and do the abstraction here. Intro in the product lifecycle framework, intro is where there is a limited number of competitors, there's a limited number of product offerings, and you've only just really come to the market. Inform is your better choice for a message strategy here because people may not know what your product is, that your product exists, and as a services marketer, one of your challenges, you may have to teach them how to use your product. What is it? What does it do? How do I co-create to get value out of it? So one of the goals out of there is brand awareness. People know you exist. Or information about the product, how it's used, how to use it, how to experience it. Or getting people's curiosity to the point that they go, I want to try that for myself, and activating trial adoption. Step down one level into growth maturity. Now, the market conditions for growth are that there is rapid expansion of the market. You are facing an additional number of competitors providing value offers that are of interest to your customer base, and so you have competition. However, because you have competition, there is less of a requirement for you as the, there's less of a requirement for you to teach the audience what to do with your product or how to use your product, and more of a requirement for you to say, mine is the best, or mine is the, has the best fit to your needs. So your persuasion style messaging, you can, in growth you can still do information, but you're probably gonna be leaning towards persuasion based messaging because you want there to be a positive attitude you want it to be in people's uh, choice sets, and you want people ultimately to be making purchases. In maturity, maturity is a 
defensive communication strategy. When you're at the maturity phase, you're trying to retain your market. So you're trying to create emotional bonds. You're trying to raise the barrier to uh, the barriers required to switch. So you're trying to raise barriers around brand switching or product switching. You're also in maturity stage, really trying to bring the brand into someone's personal experience. So light up a bunch of consumer behavior theory here around the ideas of brand communities, around the ideas of uh, brands as extensions of the self. There's a bunch of different ways to make this work. Heading down the line, the line again, immaturity phase, persuasion is also present to recruit new customers from competitors. The maturity reinforced message is to retain existing customers. So in persuade it's about get the purchase, but it may also be persuade is bring people across to from one brand to another, so brand switching. Reinforce is trying to reduce the amount of brand switching, creating loyalty, creating repeat purchase, also dealing with cognitive dissonance. So here, services marketing needs to use a fair bit of reinforcement because if you've got, or where you have a high credence level product, where you have people coming out of their service experience going, was that a good experience? The credence reinforcement. So some of the times you're hearing adverts for lawyers on radio, it's not about new customers. The lawyer adverts are there to remind existing customers that paying the money they paid to whichever law firm of noun, verb, and adjective, that law firm, their actions, their the service you purchased from them was a good purchase and you got a good return from it. So cognitive distance reduction, brand reinforcement, and getting people who are either experiencing high or going through a high experience or a high um, credence product to be reassured that their decision was the right decision. So again, that, this is what you, and particularly when you're in maturity and decline, because customer experiences are subjective, people's zone of tolerance will have steadily creeped up. So they will start going, oh, I'm getting a bit bored here. I mean, the quality is good, but the novelty is gone. So you need to be using reinforcement to reiterate the value of the quality over the value of novelty, or to promise that there is more novelty to unlock with better co-creation. All right, positioning strategies. First, a positioning strategy is absolutely locked in to segmentation and targeting. You need market segments to do market positions. So we start with the, cust the target customer. The customer's perception of your brand defines your market position. You do not define your own position. The customer does it for you. Flashing back to your intro to marketing training, one of the things you'll remember is that market positions can be done on a whole series of different criteria. One of the things could be the points of difference between the value proposition or the points of difference between the product. So if you start trying to do market segmentation here and you start trying to do the point of difference market positioning, what are, in a service, what are the customer's basis for comparison? Well, it's where your three attributes are gonna show up and be useful again. Search attributes, the basis for comparison may be the actual product, the tangible features, the service scape, the physical goods consumed during the process. If you think about back in pricing, when we started talking about the price, of, price variance between different types of massages, the Siam Sensors Massage uh, webpage, the search attributes were really high. There was a lot of different uh, components. So you could then do a fairly easy comparison. You could pop up a few other Canberra-based uh, 
massage providers and have the website side by side compare okay for this many minutes I will pay this many dollars and receive this sort of experience strong search attribute based comparisons very easy to create points of difference very easy to do a market position but when we move into things like experience attributes we move into things like the credence attributes you start having to think well how do I how are my customers going to assess the market position was particularly on a high credence uh, value where they're unsure as to whether they got value during before or after the service who are they going to compare you against so you need a bit of qualitative market research you need a bit of quantitative market research you need to understand your consumer if you are a consumer well correction when you are a consumer and when you are a marketer as a marketer if you think about your own consumption experiences in terms of if I can't take this if I can't access this product or service or good or idea or experience what is my alternative if you start thinking around your own decision sets that lets you start thinking how positioning strategy works in the mind of other consumers now another thing that we want to uh, mention the textbook mentions the idea of the three types of staff uh, the type 1 staff who only basically participate once in the transaction okay I'm, I'm quasi seriously saying that you could map the three attributes here but one of participation it's much more the search attribute so housekeeping at the hotel you if you're staying overnight you may encounter them once you may encounter them zero you may encounter them in the corridor as you're checking out but the idea here is that they are they don't play an ongoing role so the type 1 staff don't have an ongoing role so they don't have a strong sales branding and engagement requirements for their role you also should have a little crossover note here of we're talking about the role of staff and people so seduction models just popped in with service provider and also chapters 9 and 10 are showing up uh, so after the semester break the idea of service providers and people as parts of the process but here type 1 staff one-off participation their role is useful but it is not ongoing type 2 staff are where you're going to start being a bigger part of the customers experience a type 2 staff member is going to have some degree of relationship building opportunity uh, whether it's just a friendly smile and remembering your name or a friendly smile and spelling your name in a way that's Instagram worthy hey Starbucks or repeat customers you are the client you're more of the client manager or you are the go-to favored yeah you know, there's a point in time where there are some if you're going face-to-face -face shopping on a regular basis there'll be some checkout staff that you will sort of gravitate towards on a more routine basis because they end up being your favorite person uh, you can't really explain why but they are at the type 2 you're going to have recurrent or repeat interactions with the customer so you start becoming a much greater part of the customer's experience and you become a much greater embodiment of the brand the positioning and the communication message you're not necessarily a sales person not really not necessarily in the personal selling so much as you are the physical embodiment of the brand values you are dealing with this customer repeatedly therefore you are going to give this customer uh, you are going to be part of the service that they will experience final th uh, level is the type 3 staff and again this is where I've sort of roughly penciled in credence as a viable way to think about it type 3 staff deliver the service that's their job they are there to create and co-create the service for you or with you and because they do the customization they have a much greater impact 
So they may have a longer ongoing relationship with you than other aspects, other members of the organization. Uh, they may have a much greater personal engagement because you're just, uh, you're needing to work with this person. So the difference between say at uh, Anytime Fitness, type one staff are, you know, if you're there early enough in the morning or late enough in the day to encounter the cleaners. Uh, type two staff are the gym management who work there during the staffed time periods. They handle things like the, uh, the purchasing, if you need to change your membership, if you have problems with your membership, you talk to them. Type three staff in this environment would be the staff who are responsible for running the gym uh, internal uh, training sessions like the aerobics classes, the high intensity impact classes. If they retain their own personal trainers on staff, then a type three staff member would be more like your personal trainer versus your type two staff member, which is management or front desk at the gym. So there are different roles. The roles recurrent, you embody the brand, you embody the experience. So there are some challenges that we pick up and re really emphasize during the uh, chapter on people as part of the process, but it's an integration into the IMC role because you are the embodiment of the service you are the living avatar of the brand. So this is going to be a question. This is going to, I want you to have a think about this. Catch yourself some adverts, maybe switch your ad blocker off for a few hours. Maybe walk around the place. What I'm going to ask, and we'll discuss this in the class. A service value offer that you're going to promote. What aspect of it, or what aspect of the seduction model are you going to bring up into the promotion message? The value offer? Again, this is, you can even think about this as a prioritization. If you want to do all of them, there is a sequence in which they can be valued. There can be a priority. If I say pick your keep your top and discard your last, you need to be able to make that call. So the question, question for you to bring in is, which aspects? Is it about the physical service scape? Is it about the contact personnel? Is it about the other customers? Is it about the systems and processes? Is it about the overall value offer. What aspect do you want to, out of the seduction model, do you want to highlight and emphasize as your priority one pick for the promotional message? Have a think about this, maybe even grab some content, some ads and some things so you can go and have some case studies with you, but this is a good integration question. So I'm gonna put a little footnote asterisk on this one here is this is a nice, big, complicated question. So we're drawing on the service value offer and we're asking you to do something. We're asking you to apply one concept into another concept. There are a set of five choices as to which is first priority, but each of these things would be and justify. I want to use physical service scape because, give reasons. Practical or theoretical, but give reasons. We want you to be thinking, I want to do this, but why do I want to do this? So, quick element we need to uh, drop into here is the idea of the expectations. As we said at the top, Perception governs reality. Now, in a later part of the services marketing book, we're going to encounter this thing called the gap model. The gap model is really important in terms of it is also, it's an alternate way to frame an entire subject's worth of services marketing teaching. Seduction and gap play nicely with each other, but each takes a prioritization. 
In the service gap model, what you're interested in is how do we create the perception of quality and manage the delivery of quality. So reality still needs to get a run here. You can't completely dismiss it. But perception governs what people perceive governs their response because humans are irrational creatures. So what you want to do here, what you want to really focus on in the this particular framework before we get into the whole detail is there is the desired service and there's the expected service was adequate and there's perceived. If the service as perceived is greater than adequate. Job done. Congratulations, you have attained the basics. If people perceive their service as being, well, oh, that was okay, you've covered your basics, your, your job's done. If they perceive it as better than okay, that's good, it's delight, but it has consequences. So this is the concept I've mentioned a couple of times across the course, the idea of the zone of tolerance. It's desired and actual. It's the gap between what is adequate, what is service that I won't necessarily even notice. Certainly service I won't comment on, but service I'll pay my money for. Versus what is the high end? What's the top level? What's What do I really desire out of the service? So there's a gap between adequate and desired. The challenge is the more frequently you get into the desired area or exceed the desired area, the more likely it is that the adequate line will head up chasing the desired service. So the better the service is delivered, the better expectations people have, the clearer their understanding of your service once they've experienced it multiple times, and a sense of, well, it should be this good because it was this good on the last dozen times. So we're going to deal with the whole of the gap model when we get up to chapter 11, but I want to really highlight for this chapter things that are going to go forwards. So this is the expectations of service, uh, the different gaps you will see emerge when we talk about the gaps model later. But what's really significant here is that advertising personal selling, other communications, these, and personal word of mouth, these are communications, these are promotions, this is this chapter. So what we make as explicit service promises, what we say, 30 minutes or it's free, start the timers and start the stopwatches because people are going, that's an explicit promise. It's either thir inside the 30 minutes or it's free. Implicit promises come from things like the service scape, uniforms, tangibility, but they also come from price. So your price could tell a story, and this is one of the things we raised in the pricing week, is your price can tell a story, and that story has to match the rest of the delivery. Where we frequently go wrong in uh, creating a service gap is the price is too low, therefore we're expecting it's low price, it's cheap, we're expecting low quality, we get high quality and the end result starts setting off a cycle of changing the zone of tolerance. So the key is perceived service, services marketing perception governs reality. Doesn't matter how fast you deliver or how slow you deliver, as long as you deliver within the window of the expectation of the customer. Now, all things are about, am I inside that expectation? So the last sort of strange crossover element here. Now, these are various aspects that, uh, again, they're in the book, um, they're in the slide deck, they're in the elements here. I wanted to really think, of, get you to start considering this, again, this idea of the integrated theory. Services promotion has, let's take the word of mouth networks. 
Word of mouth is where you are getting a marketing message coming to you from the experiences of someone else. So chances are you're going to probably go to that person for a credence or an experience recommendation. So word of mouth, uh, I'm picking. So this other thing here I want to point out is that the words highlighted in green are my view of where I see it as a strength. Word of mouth networks works quite well around experience attribute heavy products. Promising the possible is particularly good where you've got a search based attribute product because you can find out what the others other service products list as the possible so it's easier to determine people's expectations. Mitigating the intangibles. One of the tasks of advertising is to create a message that lets people understand what a service value will be. So you can do things like turn the product tangible, display it, show it. But that works around experience. You can give a bird's eye view, third party perspective of the service being experienced. You can do symbolism, stylizing, the number of services that are represented by brand avatars, by people in s costumes or logos or other elements that create a stylized version. And the third area is visual metaphors. This is where the bigger the, the visual metaphor, the more likely it is you're in credence. So these ideas that you're going to communicate aspects of the service to create expectations and do it through these different uh, strategies. So again, this is one of these things where uh, there's going to be a lot of self-exploration here, a lot of look at, okay, what is this advert doing? What is the service doing? How, is it emphasizing the service scape? Tangibilizing. Is it emphasizing the objects that will be used on or with you during the service, tangibilizing. Is it all about the logo, symbolizing? Is it all about uh, yeah, the number of insurance companies that have animal mascots or human mascots? A visual embodiment of the message around the service. So give this a solid review because it's needing you to draw down on both personal experience but also assumptions that you're able to draw from the literature of your prior marketing studies. Now one of the things if you want to take the showcase the service approach if you want to show the service in action there are a couple of tasks that it lets you do. One of them is it you can show people how to use their service. You can literally run an advert that is somebody using your service and that will put up the search credence. It, like, the search attributes will become a lot easier. You can create a sort of roadmap expectation. We see this a lot with destination marketing and tourism marketing. We see it with holiday locations. You can showcase employee, customer employee interaction. Every hotel that's ever advertised and shown a family checking in at the reception and the happy smiling reception people greeting that person employee, customer interaction, experience, credence. So there are roles for the messaging process to teach the customer how to use the service. I'm going to pick some of those back up again when we get into the people aspect of the marketing mix. All right, a couple of things. Uh, one of the things to appreciate as a marketer and using marketing communications is that you have the opportunity to be a storyteller. And your stories that you tell through your marketing communications, you know, short vignettes, little, sometimes they can be linked, uh, sometimes they can be sort of 15 seconds, 30 seconds, sometimes they can last for a couple of years as we build up a service story. But ultimately what you're trying to do in many aspects in services marketing is you're telling the story of how your service meets the needs of the, organ of the individual, but also how it's safe for them to explore your service. So you're trying to reduce, you now again, I want to emphasize, mitigate 
or embrace. Here we're going to talk about mitigate for a moment. Key service dimensions. To mitigate risk, there are the five dimensions. Reliability, assurance, tangibility, empathy, responsiveness. The RATA measurement is a service quality measurement. It will reappear in the service quality chapter. But at the core, the idea is that a service should be reliable. You go to it to get a value, to get value from the transaction, from the engagement in the service. It should reliably provide that value. Reliability does not mean that it is consistent. Inconsistency can be a part of your reliability. You know that every time you go to this event, it will be different. You can rely on there being no repeat. The second level is assurance. Now, this is around building up the confidence. Uh, so reliable is service will deliver as per advertised. Assurance is to support, assurance supports the customer in their sense that the employees and the service delivery process is going to get the job done. So reliable is the delivery, assurance is the process. You go to a, a dentist and you can trust by, you know, the certifications on the wall say, this is a reliable dentist. The assurance is the cleanliness of the room, the, I mean, they all look the same, they're all basically some form of semi-translucent white, or it looks like it escaped from an iPod design factory. But everyone comes in wearing their white coats and everyone's looking clean and sharp and happy. It's reassuring. So assurance and reassurance are linked here. I mentioned though the assurance, I mentioned the service scape and the uniforms and so assurance also is about people and the extent to which the people can induce confidence into the customer. So your service personnel, again thinking back to seduction, how can they in, does their demeanor, does their approach, does that create a sense of reassurance in the customer? Tangibility, this is about the physical objects that are in present in the service delivery, from service gate through the uniforms, through to the facilitating goods. Do these objects assist, support, and generally help people feel like, yep, service is gonna be good, service is gonna take place. We're gonna pick on the dental surgery again. That entire rack of toolkits, you, you walk into a dental surgery and you've booked yourself in to get a filling done, and there is a neat little weapons roll of strange metal objects, bent hooks, little drill bits, few bits and pieces. I mean, it could just be craft night at the surgery, but seeing those things laid out in a ordered, apparently ordered manner, the tangible objects create a level of assurance. Also, the tangibility can create the reliability the dental surgery, the equipment that's there, and the the skill with which the dentist applies the equipment is the assurance, but the presence of the equipment makes the reliability also present. Empathy is where you're going to deal with engaging with the customer. Uh, empathy quite often comes in around things like uh, either co-creation or customization, but also around the understanding. If things go wrong, if things go right, that the staff have a connection to the customer. Finally, uh, again, picking on our dentists, if you walk in and your dentist uh, looks at the x-ray of your fillings and their first response is, Whew, yeah, ooh, sorry about that. Yeah, this is gonna be bad. Uh, it's not a lot of empathy being displayed. If they look at you, look, look at your teeth, point and say, well, new car for me. That's worse empathy. I'd love to tell you that I haven't experienced both of those, but I've experienced both of those. The empathy aspect as well when you're looking at service recovery becomes an important facet, so we pick that up a little bit later in the semester as well. Finally, it's responsiveness. Now, responsiveness is the speed within the transaction. 
So responsiveness is not just the speed with which the service gets delivered, but also things like pre and post, uh, if there's service recovery to be done, how quickly that takes place, how quickly assets like or aspects like delivery, um, pre-booking, uh, if you said 30 minutes or free on delivery, that's part of responsiveness. These five factors can be emphasized through your marketing communication to show, and they can be used for positioning strategy. You can be the empathy group. You can be the people who are kind and caring, and that's your position. You could be a bit lousy on all the other bits. I mean, by preference, most people want reliability first, assurance second, empathy third, tangibility and responsiveness. But you can also promise things around, say, build your marketing communication strategy around responsiveness, emphasizing it's quick, it's fast, it's, you know, your logos have uh, wings on them, there's always a slight motion blur to all the things that you present. There are, you sponsor a couple of sprinters. I mean, there are ways by which your marketing communications can emphasize these service dimensions to create the perception in the mind of the consumer, this is what they should be experiencing. And also, when they've left the service, their cognitive dissonance, this is what they experienced. Now, the last uh, element to perceive risk and Marcoms is crossing the streams a little bit here. I want to draw out the idea that perceptions of quality will be influenced by the service scape, tangibility, by price, price is a quality signal, the higher the price, the more you are, the more value you, you are expecting to get back, but also the greater sense that, well it's expensive, it must be good. Whether the price is preset or the price is on application signals the type of uh, service to experience. And using price as a barrier to entry to make certain that you are setting the expectations that the other customers who will be present in the room have the right type of behavior or the right type of customer. Similarly, going back to the seduction model, the other customers, the compatible and incompatible segments, advertising compatible segments showing the type of idealized customer. Who is this service for? Who does this service represent? So your marketing communications, can these are like thematic elements. Reliability, assurance, tangibility, empathy, responsiveness. Using your marketing communications to frame expectations around these five. But also using your marketing communications to establish messages around the service scape. Maybe give a demo of your service scape. If you're doing something like the Tough Mudder course, a little sort of dry, that uh, drone overflight so people can see this is what you're getting into. Communicating your price through your marketing communications, but also communicating and supporting your pricing strategy through your marcoms. If you're going to be a high quality luxury elite, there are a bunch of visual stereotypes that convey high end and expensive. There are also visual stereotypes that convey low end and cheap. You've got to be able to match the two up. So you've got to use your Marcoms to support your positioning strategy, which is delivered through your overall marketing mix. All right, a couple of things. I want to mention the core practice activity before we get in here. I also want to give the people who are watching this on the, uh, the video a chance. Uh, we're going to be doing this, it's a build your own logo. All right, this is going to make it, there'll be context, hardware and support in the room to make it happen. Why I'm asking you to do this is personal branding. You are inherently a service. You can deliver a service. The Who you are can be a service product to your employer, to your where you volunteer, to the team, to you, if you're in a sports, but also, who you are as the other customer in a bunch of services is also important. The idea here is that we want to try and do some of the things around tangibilizing, codifying, and communicating a set of expectations about yourself based on a 
visual metaphor. So there'll be a bit of work to do that in the classroom. The last uh, thing on the, the core theory idea is we're now really pushing the, the value offer connects to the positioning strategy which sets up the expectations. So you type some attributes to the present in the service offer. How do they facilitate the positioning strategy? Which means once your service value offer is in a position in a matrix inside the network of people's thinking, what are comparable products value offers either side of you? What are they priced at which gives a reference price? What would people expect to get back from it in terms of value? But what would they expect to do in terms of participation? Positioning strategy will help as well around co-creation, uh, value and co-production, because if you're in the minds of the consumer related to other things where they're expected to put in a lot of effort in order to get their return, they will understand that effort is required. It won't be a cost, it'll be a feature. And the final thing on the, uh, the theory set here is, what are you promising, what are people perceiving, and then what are you using your marketing communications to do to follow up? So, welcome to the semester, the uh, week six. It's going to be two weeks intermission to follow, and the recap will reboot at the start of week seven. As always, any questions, like, share, and subscribe. Uh, email is the best way to reach. There will be some consultation times over the semester break, but email is definitely always the easiest way to reach us.